So I had been in sales my entire career. Sales is a numbers game. It's all about focusing on the yes, not focusing on the no's and not allowing no's to deter you. So I was really skilled just by taking a lot of reps, you know, a lot of asks. I became very skilled at asking for whatever it was that I wanted. And I, and I knew it was a mathematical equation. It wasn't about emotion. It wasn't about people liking me or not liking me. It was about asking the right people at the right time in the right fashion. And I would always see it as a challenge and an opportunity, you know, that it was almost a game for me. Okay, well, what do I want next? You know, and, and I would find a way, I'd put myself in their shoes and find a way, how could I present this? How could I make this work for them such that I'll get the yes back instead of a no? So today, we are so fortunate to have a woman who is a glass ceiling breaker and a number one everything. Let me just share with you a couple of her credentials, and I know you're going to want to check her out after this podcast. So I want to give you access to this incredible powerhouse. You can read about her when we're finished. So today's guest is Heather Monahan. She is rated the top 50 keynote speaker, wait for it, in the world, in the world. She has been named number one of the most influential women in radio. She's been named limited breaking female founder by Thrive Global, Thrive Global, I'm so excited I can't even talk. And she's one of the few women to break the glass ceiling and claim her spot in the C-suite. Yes, yes, yes. Heather has a podcast called, well, she has a book called Create Confidence Creator that shot to number one on the Amazon business biographies and business motivation list. And um, you do have, and she also has a podcast that is incredible as well. And she's on the board of directors, but I could spend all our time speaking about Heather, but rather than me tell you about her, buckle up because Heather Monahan is about to take you for a ride. Welcome Heather. And thank you so much for being on this podcast today. Well, thanks for having me. This is, this is fantastic. You have accomplished so much in your career, your lifetime. So why don't you tell us how it started? You want to start from when you began to where you are now, going from corporate to entrepreneur or back vice versa, wherever you're comfortable, we're, we're all ears. So I, I grew up pretty poor in Worcester, Massachusetts. And what that gave oh, me East was Coast. Yes. East Coast. I started working when I was nine years old. I had a paper route. I started bussing tables at diners, started waiting tables, bartending. You know, I really was essentially refining my sales skills and sales approach, you know, for almost, oh my gosh, you know, more than 15 years before I ever got my first real job. And then I got to corporate America, got into sales and advanced really quickly because I had had all this prior experience really selling. And so, you know, I got what kind of, what were you selling in corporate? My first job out of school, I worked for the Gallo winery and I was selling wine. Uh, then I went from the wine business to the media business and started selling radio. And I just kept moving up the corporate ladder, ultimately landing myself in the C-suite as a chief revenue officer. And, um, you know, really just, put in the work and um, kept asking for more and advancing myself. And, and, you know, really um, I ended up being named one of the most influential women in in radio in 2017. And then unexpectedly the CEO that I had worked for became ill and he chose his daughter to replace him. And she fired me immediately. Oh, okay. Well, hang on, hang on one second. Let's go back just a little bit. You said that you kept asking for more. Right. Because a lot of women are raised good girls. You wait. You wait to be asked for the guy to call or text. You wait for the promotion. You wait for the raise. Usually that's waiting for good dough. So tell us a little bit about how the skill set you were able to develop along with the confidence to ask for what you wanted. You know, it's really a, around repetition, right? So I had been in sales my entire career. Sales is a numbers game. It's all about focusing on the yes, not focusing on the no's and not allowing no's to deter you. So I was really skilled just by 
taken a lot of reps, you know, a lot of asks. I became very skilled at asking for whatever it was that I wanted. And I, and I knew it was a mathematical equation. It wasn't, it wasn't about emotion. It wasn't about people liking me or not liking me. It was about asking the right people at the right time in the right fashion. And I would always see it as a challenge and an opportunity, you know, that it was almost a game for me. Okay, well, what do I want next? You know, and, and I would find a way I'd put myself in their shoes and find a way. How could I present this? How could I make this work for them such that I'll get the yes back instead of a no? Okay. So how were you able to develop that resiliency of hearing no and not taking it as the personal rejection? Because it's not just women that that happens to. It's, it's a lot of people. So what, what's the secret that you have for that, for the listeners as, as a nugget of wisdom? You know, it's not sexy. It's a, it's competence builds confidence, right? So the more you do something, the more competent competence, you become. Competence builds confidence. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's like if you're um, playing baseball, you know, the first day that you get on the little league team, you're not going to be an all star. You're not going to be the best player. But if you get there every day before everybody and take more swings and, and hit the ball more times and over years, you're going to become very competent. And that competence will build confidence within you such that you're willing to swing for the fences. And so sales and business is the exact same way. I always looked at it as okay, I've been asking for things since I was nine years old and I would want to add houses to my paper route, right? Or I've been asking for things from the time I was waitressing to upsell people additional food to raise the tab so that I would make more on a tip. You know, all of these things are just putting the work in and asking. And the more that you do it, and some people will say, oh, you know, I'm not in sales. So how do, how do I do it? We'll start asking for things when you go to Starbucks. Hey, can I grab an extra cup with this, please? Thank you. You know, just start asking for small things along the way. Put those little reps in and you'll be surprised how quickly you'll be able to see, oh, this isn't that scary anymore. So it's it's so interesting that you use baseball because baseball, perhaps more than any other sport, is a game of failure, right? If you if you only if you strike out six out of nine times at bat, you're batting 300 and you're a Hall of Famer. So you have to be able to take that strikeout, forget about it. Yeah, that's yesterday's news. What did you learn from it? And then move forward with the confidence that you can now achieve success, right? Um, so I, I think that's a great example about the Starbucks, how, how to ask. How about speaking a little bit about the internal motivation, or I should say the internal inspiration, right? Because somebody can tell you to have confidence. Somebody can say, don't be afraid, don't worry, but you have to own that. So how did that happen for you? Even though you've had the repetition, right? The practice, there's still some, some people can do it forever and then they quit. So for you, there's no, clearly there's no quit. So well, but there have, you know, confidence has ebbs and flows to it. It's not a static trajectory, right? So for me, when I got divorced, I, I my confidence disappeared. I remember thinking it, it got obliterated. This was not, I did not project this in my life. How did this happen? This was not in my game plan, right? So right. I didn't leave. Who am I? You know, who is, I'm a failure, right? So I dipped my confidence at that point in time. I had to rebuild it back up. Then the 0809 recession hit and I was leading a massive company and we had to lay off a third of our employees. My confidence dipped. You know, I, I felt responsible for these people. There are so many times throw I was cheated on by the man I thought was going to marry me when I was in college, right? My confidence disappeared overnight. So I've had so many examples in my life of losing confidence that I've learned, oh, okay, I've been here before. I know that I can rebuild this. In fact, I know confidence doesn't just stay high all the time. And if you're growing and stepping into new things and trying different things and meeting new people, your confidence is going to ebb and flow all the time. So I see it as just part of that journey and part of the ride. And I remind myself, you've been here before, you know how to build this again. This isn't foreign. And one of the cornerstones for me, and I see this with a lot of people, I was actually on another podcast earlier today. And the gentleman said, you know, Heather, I, I have a really hard time asking for what I want. And I see that you always ask for what you want. Why do you think that is? For me, I just, 
I just know that, you know, I get in a situation, I just know I can't do it. And he was with so much passion. He's explaining to me how he's not, he's not able to do that, but I can. And I, and I just started laughing, listening to him. I said, listen to that story. You're a great salesperson. You just sold yourself that you cannot do it. Good for you. If that's your goal. And he said, well, it's not my goal. I said, then how about this? Stop telling yourself that story, which is holding you back. Right. And start with that same passion and same conviction. Start telling yourself a story. Give me one time in your life you ask for something and got it. I just won. Well, I got my wife to marry me. And that was a huge win. Okay, great. Well, then tell that story the next time. Oh, you were able to get this knockout woman to marry you. You are so convincing. You are so compelling. Start reminding yourself of the win stories you have instead of focusing focusing so much on what isn't working. And for me, you know, I remember growing up that I was labeled the social one and my sister was labeled the smart one. And so I let that story stick with me my entire life. I wasn't aware of it at the time, you know, but subconsciously I was telling myself that story. When I look back in business, I remember different times I was in the C-suite, right? I had the title, I have the big paycheck, and I definitely had the business acumen and experience. But I remember being invited to a meeting and the person that was hosting the meeting had an MBA from Harvard. And it's funny, I said, you know what I'm not you're from? Ma- you're from Massachusetts, right? I'm from Massachusetts. And so that in my world, that was sort of, you know, the pinnacle Pinnacle. of intelligence. And And in their world too, by the way, Heather. (laughs) For sure. And so I, you know, I bowed out of the meeting and I, I never told anyone at that point in time why I did, but the reason why I knew I did is I thought I'd be exposed as the social one. Maybe somehow this person was the smart one and they'd be able to identify that I wasn't. It's so interesting cut to in the pandemic, a a professor from Harvard reaches out to me on LinkedIn because of some content I was creating. And he said, could you come in and teach a class for me? And I did. And then he ended up bringing me on during the pandemic as his teacher's assistant at Harvard. And it was such a great experience because I got to see myself through the lens that other people see me. I was scared to do it at first. I couldn't get into Harvard. I was intimidated but I decided to show up as that real version of me and say, you know what, maybe through my experience in life, I can give them real world experience where they have, you know, they're great at books and and testing. And and I wasn't great at that, but maybe my real world business experience can add value to them. So I showed up, I taught the class, we got great feedback, helped a lot of people. And I was able to decide, you know what, from now on, I'm going to put those rose colored glasses on when I look in the mirror, instead of when just when I look outside at other people. So I am so struck by what you're saying, because um, as someone that has two master's degrees and a doctorate, right, I am amazed at how much people think that really matters. Like, I know I might get myself into trouble. Heather. I know so many idiots with doctorates. You know, the joke is BS, bull, MS more, PhD, piled high and deep, right? And I also think you're underestimating there's a lot more involved into getting into Harvard that has nothing to do with brains. And I literally just read research specific to Harvard, but I believe in general, and and don't misunderstand me. I very much value education. I think it's very important, but there's all different types of education, right? And they're talking about the people, the kids today that get into the Ivy Leagues, what they have mastered is how to please the adults. So they please the coach. They get the starting position. They please the teacher to get the A. They please the parents to get the good girl, the good boy. And here's what we've learned, Heather. And this is what, this is what you have in spades. And you don't need me to tell you this now, right? But if we could have told our former self, you're finding that, and not everybody, you know, not a, just a gross oversimplification. I don't want Harvard reaching out to me and yelling at me, but what we're, and they can, and I really don't care, but what they, what they're finding, and I think this explains a lot for the condition of the world today, is that these kids don't know how to critically think because they don't know what they think. They don't know what they feel. What they've done is they've mastered, this is what my coach wants me to know and think. And this is what my parents and my teachers. Now, there is a lot of value. Emotional intelligence talks about understanding your own emotions, right? And being able to read that of others, right? So there's a lot of value in being able to read other people, but it's useless if you don't know where you're coming from, you know? And, Mm -hmm. and, 
I'll share a funny story. So I'm originally from Brooklyn. This is clearly not a Harvard accent. And when we moved from New York to Connecticut, my husband was working in Greenwich at the time. I was so self-conscious of my accent. And my husband was like, are you crazy? You have more degrees. You can run circles around these guys. I'm like, yeah, but they're making all this money. He goes, yeah, no, 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 no. I'm like, they must be so smart. And he's like, mm, yeah, I don't think so. And I'm like, really? Well, then I move here. I move to Connecticut and I meet these guys and I'm like, oh my God, my husband's right. And then I learned to ask the real question, who'd your daddy play golf with? <laughs> so there's a lot of, you know, I, I think so many of us don't appreciate that what we know Everybody else doesn't know. And it doesn't matter if it's from Harvard or if it's it's a formal education, right? And and honestly, there's nothing, there's nothing like the school of hard knocks. Yeah, you're so right. And for everyone listening, there's something unique and special about you that you know that other people don't. And you've got to put those rose-colored glasses on when you look in the mirror instead of just when you look at people outside of you. Right, right. That's that's that is so interesting that I, I'm just struck for someone that's so accomplished like you, that you'd be impressed with this Harvard degree. I'm, and I guess there was a time I was too. And now I'm just like, whatever. So what, what would you, all oh, you've interviewed so many different people. I mean, your book about creating confidence, who struck you, who, who has struck you interestingly? And you were surprised by who they were, perhaps who they really are, as opposed to their persona. I'll tell you, people ask me a lot, you know, what's your favorite interview? You know, because I've had my podcast now for three years and interviewed, you know, a lot of people. There's one that sticks out to me. There's actually two, but it's the same people. Um, Jesse Itzler, who is an incredible um, entrepreneur, incredibly successful author, just a, unbelievable speaker, amazing talent. That interview was so impactful for me. He was, I went to his home, you know, before the pandemic, I really wanted to do everything in person because I just believe that magic, you know, that you can create when you're with two people is that's when people give you their cell phone number. That's when Chemistry. people say, yeah, yeah, let's, let's stay in touch or Hey, next time you're around, let me know. And, you know, I love that. I love that, that human connection. And so I had gone to meet with him. No, I mean, they're billionaires, right? Him and his wife, Sarah Blakely. And you, you never know when you walk in a situation like that. Is and it going to be? Thanks, right? Sarah Blakely. Yes, ex- okay, exactly. So sure. but and, so, right. and so, you know, I didn't know what, it, he was so down to earth. The team was so down to earth. Everyone was so cool. They had food for me when I got there. I didn't want it, but like, you know what I'm saying? Just, <laughs> just thought they were thoughtful, like not. In, in your mind, you might tell yourself stories about certain people like, oh, they're going to be this way. And it's so funny. It almost always ends up being completely different than what you think. And he shared so much wisdom with me that day, especially around parenting, which, you know, I, as you know, I have a 14 year old son and I'm a single mom. So I'm always looking, you know, I want to become a better mother, better leader for my son. And so I'm always looking for ways around my, my child. How can I lead? And it was interesting. I was having a tough time with my son at, the, at that point in time. He'd gone away to camp. He was younger and he had a really bad experience. He felt scared. He didn't want to sleep there. You know, just normal kid stuff. And so I started second guessing. I don't know if I send him again this summer. And I was telling Jesse about um, overnight basketball camp. And he was like, wait, no. let me tell you something. And it was so great. I needed someone to talk to me the way he did. He said, here's the thing. You want your son to start doing new things when he's 21 in college, or you want him never to have failed when he gets out on his own. Are you setting him up for failure? And when he put it to me like that, I was like, wow, that's an interest. I hadn't thought of it that way. He said, here's the thing, Heather, be there by his side, but then send him on his way into these scary things and let him go figure it out. He said, I promise you this year is going to be so much better than last year. But if you don't push him out there and give him that confidence to go for it, he'll be 21 years old sitting in your basement. And so that year I took his words and I pushed my son back into overnight, you know, sleepaway camp and he killed it. He loved it. He had the most amazing experience, made so many great friends. And I was just so pleased. So anyway, that was a super powerful moment personally for me via that interview. And then I had the opportunity to interview him and his wife um, together. And, and that they, they have this amazing marriage and they're, they're fun and funny. And it was just so real and cool. And that was and like you got a, the cell was, phone was, number. I take it. 
I, I did. <laughs> I, I did. So, so here's what's so interesting. And this is where as someone that focuses on trust and relationships, this is where, the, you know, what happens in your business relationships is wherever you go, there you are, right? It's not different than, than your personal, your marriage, your parenting. Let kids, let the people that work with you and for you fail fast and fail forward. Because if you're not failing, you're not trying and you're not innovating, right? And I could go on a whole tangent and I won't, but I could go on a whole tangent about we're not allowing children to fail today. So it used to be the um, helicopter parent. Now it's the, it's the um, snow, the, the ski, the parent ahead, the snow plowing parent. So the helicopter parent at least let the kid fail and swoop in and pick them up, right? It's the now the snow plowing parent goes in ahead of the kid and paves the way so they never fall and fail. And that's why for many kids, the first time they really experience failure is when they don't get into the Harvard or the college of their choice. And it's as if the sun will never set another day. And you're doing your kid a huge disservice, right? It's like the, the, the employee, the, the leader. That's over managing on, you know, you're never going to let your people shine. You're never going to let them reach their full potential. But I do have to tell you a really funny story about a Spanx. Spanx, am I saying it right? Yeah. Spanx. So I was at a workshop in San Diego a couple of weeks ago, uh, co-leading a workshop. And we talked about Sarah Blakely, right? Because she's a female, you know, we all respect her. So I said, I guess everybody there was younger than me. I said, you know, it's really interesting what she did. And I'm not minimizing what she did, but I said, really what she did was she modernized and innovated girdles. And we're talking about that a little bit. And then a young woman turns around, she looks at me, she goes, Dr. Patty Ann, what's a girdle? <laughs> she was young. So somebody else Googled girdle and first it didn't come up. And then she showed it to her and she goes, oh, you're right. That's like, anyway, it, it, it was just so interesting. Like the whole dynamic of how we evolve and grow and what's ever relevant today won't be, won't be relevant tomorrow. If anybody's doing business today, like they were three years ago, they're probably out of business. So and now look at Kim Kardashian with Skims, right? Which is in, an innovation off of Spanx. So it's a, it, it, these new iterations just keep coming in, in any business. It's amazing. It's amazing. So um, anybody else that surprised you, maybe in a negative way, and you don't have to reveal who they were. When you, I mean, I definitely have had the interview with someone who appears on social media to be one way and isn't genuinely that way when you're, you know, with them. Right. So how, how did, and how, how do you reconcile that for yourself? Right. Because we, we all want, we all want to have our heroes. Right. And, and then you find out maybe your hero or somebody that you looked up to is like, oh, there's shit. <laughs> It, to me, it's more humanizing. Like it almost gives you permission to be flawed, right? Like that you see well, that these people who have millions and millions of followers and make millions and millions of dollars and are so successful, quote unquote, you know, they're not really the real deal. And to me, that's like, oh, wow, that's great. Cause I am. Wow. I feel better about me the way I'm like, oh my gosh, people are going to be excited when they figure out that I'm really the same on social as I am in real life. So it actually made me feel better about myself. Great, great. So how do you, what do you think about, and we haven't really heard about this a lot in the news lately, and, I, and I'm not, I don't want to get political at all. I, I don't go there. But I'm wondering, as a, as a true thought leader in the female entrepreneurial space, what do you think about the Me Too movement and, and the gender conversation? Do, do you see it playing out at all? And how can women use whatever is going on to their advantage? I mean, I, I don't hear about it very much anymore. I don't, you right. know, I don't, I, it doesn't seem to be really as top of mind. There's so many other things now because of the pandemic and, you know, the war and, and, mm -hmm. and like you alluded to this, the new conversation around gender and gender bias and not, you know, choosing to be male or female. And it, it's, 
that seems to be really dominating um, conversations these days. So, you know, to me, it's just all about showing up as who you are, right? And if you are in a situation where you are being harassed by anybody, a man, a woman, whoever it is at work, speaking up, you know, asking for help and and really shining a light on the challenges that you're dealing with so that the hopes are that those people that come after you won't have to deal with those same kinds of cultures. Right, right. And do you feel, because you work internationally, right? Mm-hmm. What yeah. what do you see as the difference f- from an entrepreneurial perspective, not necessarily a woman, but but an uh, entrepreneurial perspective for um, work being based in the States as opposed to um, anywhere else? Like, you know, love or, love or more hate him. I, I tend, I'm fascinated by Elon Musk for many reasons. But <laughs> if you read his bio, if you read his bio, he felt very strongly what is it? South Africa, South America, South Africa, Canada, he, and, and it landed in the States. He felt very strongly that he had to be in the United States to be successful or to have the opportunity to do what he wanted to do. So where, where, what have you experienced with that? Oh my gosh. I feel so blessed that I happen to be born in this country. And, you know, for any of us that have the opportunity to live here, you know, I'm so grateful. And, and to your point, there's so many issues around political and this and that, and, you know, this division in our country, which stinks, but I still don't want to live anywhere else. You know, I, I love, I love living here. I feel so grateful for our freedom. I feel so grateful that we do have um, the ability to speak our mind and have a voice and, and not have this backlash as some other countries have to deal with. So, you know, it's interesting due to the pandemic, I started virtual speaking, which was new to me. But what that meant is I'm able to speak in Australia. I'm able to speak in Japan. I'm able to speak in all of these countries I you know, previously hadn't been traveling to. And so I see so much difference around culture through these Zoom talks that I give. And you know, we always do Q&A at the end. And those are really telling. But what I learned from all of these is the most aggressive line of questioning, the most honest line of questioning always has come from United States companies, States. not not when I'm speaking internationally, for sure. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, a- as a quintessential American New Yorker, you know, people say to me, gosh, it's so refreshing. You tell it as it is. You're so you're so real. And I'm like, I don't know any other way to be, you know, and I think that that the states has allowed that for women. You know, I've spoken in Saudi Arabia and Dubai and, you know, you know, places where women don't have the freedom that we have. Even even London, it's just, uh, England, it's very different to be a woman, even a, a female entrepreneur in Europe or, or in these other countries. And to your point, we're not perfect, but no other place I would want to have been. And we you know, it's interesting because when you travel, sometimes you have to be like, well, I have to be like, all right, pull it back, pull it back. You know, it might not, it might not be appreciated. And oh, it might take a little longer because I see you're like me, you're speaking fast. I'm like, oh, here we are. You know, And I can see other people like trying to keep up kind of thing. So tell, tell us about your book and what inspired that and you know, your, the response you've had, share that. Yeah. My, my new book is called Overcome Your Villains. It's a three-step process to overcome any adversity in business and in life. And I'm a big fan of data doesn't lie. So uh, ever since I wrote my first book, the majority of DMs that I get are, hey, when's the next book coming out? Are you going to talk about the next steps, how you picked yourself up from getting fired, how you advanced yourself as an entrepreneur? Are you going to reveal, you know, what the steps were that you took and how I can take them too? And so I would get so many of those messages that it it really just directed me, okay, this is what people want me to create. I'm going to go ahead and and create it. So that's really the rationale behind this new book. It's everything that's happened since the day I got fired to getting to where I am today and what those shortcuts are that I took, what the tactics are and what levers you can pull to do the same kind of things, no matter what situation you're in. But the key to the whole thing is really all about overcoming your villains, starting with the villains that are around you. And then once you've cleared out those villains, dealing with the biggest villain you're ever going to meet, which is the one that lies between your own two ears. I was just going to say, so for many people, um, it's that inner critic, it's that inner voice, it's the limited beliefs. So that's, so how, what are some of the golden nuggets, right? Because 
And, and you mentioned something about shortcuts. Are there shortcuts? Because I don't think there's shortcuts to success. Well, I mean, there's some tactics that, you know, definitely okay. are going to set you up for success, right? So for example, one of the questions I get asked a lot is how did you get Gary B as a guest, right? So okay. this is, this is a shortcut. So a great shortcut for any goal that you have, if, if it involves another person, take out a Google alert on that person. And so what's going to happen is every morning when you wake up, you're going to get an email from Google that's going to say, here's what's going on with Gary Vaynerchuk today. And it's going to map it out for you, giving you all of these updates and all of this knowledge to help you say, how can I leverage this information to get what I want? And so one day I saw uh, the Google alert said, Gary Vaynerchuk just launched a new wine company um, with his partner, Trouty. And I thought, hmm, Gary's tough to get to, but maybe Trouty's not tough to get to. I went to LinkedIn. I sent Trouty a DM and I said, hey, um, I was in the wine business for years, had a lot of success, a lot of failures, love to jump on a call and give you, you know, the, the skinny on the business and, and hopefully set you up for more success than I had. He jumped on a call with me. You know, I just wanted to serve and, and offer help. We ended up speaking for an hour. He was from Boston. I'm from Boston. You know, we had a lot in common. And at the end of the call, he said, wow, I really owe you for this. If there's ever anything I can do for you, just let me know. And so I said, great, I'd love to have your partner, Gary, on my podcast. Can you facilitate that and make it happen? And he started laughing. He said, oh, my gosh, I hate you. Yes, I'm happy to help you. And, you know, we've become friends. He helped me to get Gary on. So that is that's a way to kind of cut the line, right? You don't need to. Most people are just DMing Gary Vaynerchuk ad nauseum and posting on his social media. and He's not seeing it. There are different ways and tactics that you can go about things that can help you kind of leapfrog over everybody else. So I love that because you did two, you did two things, right? That I'm sure the listeners picked up on. One is you offered to give, right? Let me share with you my knowledge, not, hey, you know, you want something from them. And then two, um, you found a connection, right? So you're from Boston. You and I, before we started the call, like, oh, we're both from the East Coast, right? So you, you look for that commonality to build the relationship. But I am surprised you asked for the Gary connection right at the end. I would have thought you waited till the next email. Just thought. Oh, they- no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Once he opened up that floodgate, I was all in. <laughs> I think that, I think that's great. What that, like, if, to all the listeners out there, if, if you if that's the only thing, only in quotes, you learn from every podcast you listen this week, Heather has just given you probably a million dollars worth of gold right there. I mean, that is that is brilliant. So I am so anxious to hear the other two. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, basically in every chapter, I have outlined different hacks and tactics that people can implement in their business, whether it's, I do a chapter on how I landed my TEDx talk and then how I prepped for it, right? So how to give a big speech, how to give a big presentation, what are those tactics that are involved and then how to actually land a TEDx because people think it's so hard, you know, to get it. And it's actually, it's not that hard. So, you know, the skinny on that is I took out a Google alert on TEDx speakers wanted, right? Of course, because then I get an email every morning telling me, Heather, there's five opportunities that you can apply for. It's a numbers game, right? Right. But then what I also learned is everyone that's putting a TEDx event on is a volunteer. So instead of making it about you in the pitch saying like, I'm a great speaker, I'm going to add value, make it about them. You know, so wow, thank you so much for volunteering. It's so great to see that you've made this, you know, part of your life's work, that you're giving up so much time. I'd love to come in and support you. I'd love to sell out the arena for you. I'd love to promote it on my social media. I'd love to support you at your VIP sponsor events. I'd love to get behind you and anything that you guys are doing to really try to bring my value and support. Would love to have a conversation around this, right? So making it about the recognizing what they're doing and then supporting their efforts, which really isn't about your speech. It's more about they have bold. They need to sell their events out. They need to have sponsors. And how can you help add value and support that? And then from the speaking standpoint, the key is really, you know, you're supposed to be sharing an idea. Like what is this game-changing idea thought we're sharing? And then how does it tie back to their theme? So you need to do your research. You need to go to their website. You need to read about the theme that they've chosen for this event. And for mine, it was rethinking relationships. And so my original pitch 
was first I made it about them. I told them that I would, I have a good social media following. I will sell out the arena. I will promote it until you have no tickets left. I, that's a commitment I made to you, right? Like I, I am your part in on this. Um, if you add me to the lineup and then I went on to pitch, okay, rethinking relationships. Let's rethink the relationship between C students and the C-suite. I was an average student in school, but I made it to the C-suite, which is, you know, only a very, very small percentage of women do that. So I was, you know, proposing this idea that you don't need to, to your point earlier, be an A student to find business success. In fact, I believe that being more of an average student will launch you to that business success. Um, so that was what I led with. And then a month before giving my talk, they actually challenged me to dig deeper. They wanted something a little grittier. And we ended up coming up with my new talk, which was re-examining the relationship with women in business and how it's worse than the Me Too movement, that that should have been the real movement around identifying the female bullies at work and how much havoc they wreak for, for other women. That's, wow, that's amazing. And so basically you went with the how women don't support other women at work. Oh yeah, to me, that's the biggest elephant in the room in any business situation or equation is that you know, people believe, or I used to believe for sure that, wow, women will be my biggest advocates and they'll be my cheerleaders. And it was funny what I found, my biggest cheerleaders in a male dominated industry were men. My mentors were men. The people who supported me, promoted me, men. Never at one point, this is back in corporate America. It's very different for me today. I have tons of phenomenal um, supporters. You being one of them, a woman supporting other, I have so many, Amber Lee, like I have so many cheerleaders and champions and partners out there that are female. However, that was not the case in corporate America. It was more of this idea of scarcity. Like there's one seat at the table that a woman can claim and I'll be damned if she's going to get it. I'm going to cut her out. I'll find a way to get rid of her and cut her out of the loop. I'll get it. And that was what I remember or how I really felt treated when I was back in corporate America. So it's so interesting you say this. So I do a lot of work. I go into companies and I'll do I'll create women's councils or women's programs to empower women and like literally move the needle. So there's one company I've been working with for a while. And when I, it's a tech company. And when, when I went in, I think they had, you know, I'm making the numbers up, but maybe they had 4% women. And now we have like 34%. And the elephant in the room was, yeah, it's, it was incredible. We had the support of the chairman of the board and the CEO who is in my fast five, if you will. Great, great guy, very much supports women, doesn't just give it lip service, truly puts, you know, and created a whole structure. And it was a strategy, right? Because we want the right people. We don't want, we don't want you second guessing saying, oh, you're a woman. And then we were having a conference and I said, look, we have to address the elephant in the middle of the room, which is women not supporting women. But what I have said, and I do, and it is changing, although not as rapidly in COVID, everything's up in the air, right? However, this is where I feel you, you alluded to it, but I want to just take it a little bit deeper, deeper. If men, if there was, there was 10 executive positions and only one of them was for a man, they would be killing each other too for that one spot, right? So it's not like, oh, what's wrong with you women? Well, Men, I truly believe, would be the same, act the same way if there was only one seat at the table for them. What do you think? I mean, it's interesting because that's never the case. So we don't really know, right? So it's a kind of a tough um, right. question to answer because we don't have any data to support it. So just, I guess, theoretically, it makes sense what you're saying. However, I still go back to um, my personal experiences, you know, Let's give an example. When I was in leadership in media and I would have one sales management opportunity open, right? It was either a man's getting or a woman. Didn't matter to me. I didn't care. I wanted right. the best person in there. And what did that competitive landscape look like? Because I would get, let's say six people were applying for the job, three men, three women. You know, I, when I look back, I did not, at least in my experience, I did not see the men try to sabotage the other competitors the way I did with women. And I, I almost feel like culturally through media, through movies, whatever it is that we, there's been this narrative that, you know, women sabotage other women and that it's, it's okay. And that, you know, that they're not really cheerleading for, for one another. And somehow 
that scarcity mindset that to me, it's just, it's so prevalent in corporate America. And, and just in my experience, I did not see it the same way in the situations where, when I saw men competing for, for, for a role or a seat at the table. I, you know, I totally understand what you're saying and you're right. It's hypothetical, but I do, I do feel that it would be, I don't think men would be so collegial and so into mentoring and sponsoring other men if there was truly one seat in my company and one seat in your company and one seat in the company. Now, I, 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 it just common sense dictates to me, right? right. Survival right. of the fittest, if you think about it. But I, I, you know, COVID, of course, has changed everything. Prior to COVID, I have. I did see it start to shift. I hate to say it. I think there's been a little bit of regression. I think there's been a regression for women in the workplace everywhere. Hence, I believe, and I think this is the good news. That's why women are starting businesses and becoming entrepreneurs in record numbers. And we are so, so going to change the world, right? Because if you give if you give a man money, he'll buy a toy. If you give a woman money, she'll feed her village, so to speak. All right. Um, so that's the great. And number three, I'm so excited you're, you're being so transparent because people will absolutely buy your book. We will make sure of it. But the third hack, um, so I was mentioning about giving presentations, right? And, and that's something I have a lot of experience with. I've been doing it my entire career. And now I've built my speaking business around speaking, right? So I'd like to share with people, and this is for a mom that's on the PTA. This is for a person giving a toast at a wedding, right? Like if you, at some point in your life, you're going to need to speak up and give a talk or a presentation. You don't have to be a sales leader or a keynote speaker to do it. And when you do, I want to empower people to be as successful as possible and be heard, right? Because it's really about, we live in a noisy world. People are always on their phones. They're not paying attention. It's very challenging to grab someone's attention in, in this day and age. And so I like to set people up for success and give them the things, the tools that I've learned. Number one, I, I will always believe this, leading with a personal story anytime, whether you're giving a toast, whether you're speaking at a PTA meeting, or you're giving your TED Talk lead with a personal story to captivate and pull in the audience. The most critical portion of a talk is really that first minute, right? Where people are going to decide, am I listening? Is there something to learn or add value to my life here? Or is this boring and I'm checking out and I'm going to be on my phone texting everybody that I know for the next hour, right? So really focus in on, and I believe in testing and trying things with different groups. My poor son, I'm constantly standing up for him and saying, Tell me what you think about this lead in for my talk, you know, this week. And then I'll test it on him. He'll be like, oh, I thought that was super boring. Now I liked it better when you did this one. And he'll remind me. Leave it some- to kids, man. They'll be brutally honest. But that's what we need, right? Like so many people say, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm too nervous. Listen, the real day is the day you give the talk. Let these little moments with your friends, your family, whoever, strangers, or just record yourself on a video and see what you like and don't like. But put that work in, show up and, and do the reps, right? Then the other thing is you want to make it about the people that are there, right? You want to tell them what, what value are, are they going to get out of being there with you so that they want to hang in till the end, right? And maybe you're like, all right, listen, this is going to, you know, I come in really high energy. And if that resonates with you, you definitely want to jump around ahead of time. You want to listen to your playlist of your life that fires you up so that you're going in there saying, okay, why am I doing this? I'm, I'm doing this to change one person's life. I'm doing this to add value, you know? Really make it about that why so that it can help you push through that fear. Anytime you feel nervous before a presentation or a talk, remind yourself there's a fine line between fear and excitement. I'm excited. I'm Mm -hmm. excited. I'm excited. And the more you start telling yourself that, you start believing it. Then I write on the bottom of my shoes, I can, I will. Write a message to yourself to remind yourself how amazing you are. Look at three other times in your life that you did something big that you were afraid of and say, I lived through that. I this is, this is proof, social proof that this is going to go well today too, right? Like I really put in the work to remind myself, I wear a power color. When I was nervous for my Ted talk and I was so nervous for it, I wore blue because that blue and red are like my go-tos. If I'm nervous, I'm, I'm doing, so, I need every little help that I can get, right? So I want to get my hair done. I want to get my makeup done. I want to wear the dress that makes me feel like a million bucks. I invest in me because it makes me feel really worthy and remind me like I am worth all of this work. I am worth taking this stage. 
Then I lowered the expectations on myself. Right before I walked out um, to give my talk, I said, if you don't walk out there right now, you'll never forgive yourself. If you walk out there and blow it, I'm going to be so proud of you. And I just took all the pressure. And it, really, you need to do that in these moments where you're in a pressure cooker and you're, you're putting too much pressure on yourself. Hey, it's about showing up and doing it. It's not about anything else. And, and too often we get caught up in that. I use other hacks like lavender scents for me are a really big thing, right? So I constantly have lavender in my back pocket so I can get centered, get calm, remind myself of other times that I've taken big stages and how I felt, how I impacted people. I keep um, a file on my phone called Fam Love. And anytime I get a beautiful note about how my book changed their life or a talk changed their life and how they left the bad marriage or left the job, I save all those. So when I start doubting myself or getting scared, I go to fam love and I start reading. And when I read that, I'm like, oh, hell yeah, I'm going out there to take this stage right now. Right. So maybe you're giving um, a toast for your best friend at their wedding and you're so scared and so nervous. Go back and read that that letter that she wrote to you when she asked you and said why it was so important that you be the one to give that talk. Make it about them and stop making it about ourselves. And that can propel us through those those real nerve wracking moments. That's great. And you mentioned colors. I don't know the frequencies, but I know there's such thing as frequencies attached to color. And so I find that interesting. And I think lavender is known to be a very soothing. So that in, in, very interesting. So you feel that, you know, and you also talked about the being, you know, afraid and being excited. So. I, I love to dabble in neuroscience. I dare say I'm an expert by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Me too. Don't worry. <laughs> but, great. Great. You know, so, you know, I don't play a neuroscientist at work and I don't play one on TV. Right. But apparently um, fear and excitement, and I'm very much into the mind body connection more and more and more. And um, cause we have functional MRIs that can show us this stuff. Right. So apparently fear and excitement biologically in our body shows up the same way. It's a matter of how we label it. And that's what you just said that's brilliant. And I want the listeners to hear that. You define what you want that emotion to be. And I think that's absolutely brilliant, right? So. We can make it fear that paralyzes us, or we can make it excitement that cheers us on, right? And then exactly energy. And then the other thing that you said, which I think is so important to just sum up for our, for the listeners, is that when you're nervous, afraid, never did it before, all normal, natural. Some of the best speakers in the world I know are vomiting in the bathroom before they go on stage. You would be shocked as shocked as to who they are. They do this as well. And you say, okay, when have I done something before that I thought I couldn't do? When have I put limitations on myself? And then I found out they were just my own limitations. And if I could do that, then I can do this. If you remember when you first started to ride a bike, it was petrifying when the adult let go of the seat. Now you look back and you say, I was afraid of that. That is easy breezy. That, that is true for us throughout every area of our life. And certainly in our careers and our work. Oh my gosh, Heather, I want to be respectful of your time. I could talk with you for ever. I want to leave you with one question before you can tell people how they can find out more about you. What is the one book that you most recently reread and why? I am really into this Dr. Joe Dispenza right now. It's so oh my goodness. You're talking yes, about, yes, yes, yes. You're talking about mind-body connection. It is not for the faint of heart, right? So it's interesting. The teacher shows up when you're ready to yep. learn, right? And I, I'm sure I could have been exposed to his material. Probably was a few years ago, but I wasn't really at as oh, open minded, right? Yeah. And so I, I really, I, I'm like all in on this. I, I just bought his other book, and I've read this book now on Audible three times, and I just mm-hmm. 
it, some of this information is so there's so much information and knowledge there that I have to keep listening again and again, because I'm learning something new every time I listen. And it's also serving as a reminder for me and to your point around neuroscience and, you know, understanding the brain and that mind body connection. Wow. Some of this stuff is so different than what we learned growing yeah. up. And it's so powerful that I, I, my tendency is to go back to my old way of thinking just out of habit. You know, I'm 47 years old. And of course be like, Oh, I remembered it this way. It's not comfort Wait a minute. zone. It's not comfort. Yeah. And I have to pump the brakes and I put this, this, yeah. um, audible back on. And it's been, um, it's really been a, a powerful experience. I highly encourage this work for anybody to check it out. If they're interested. The, that, that conference I was, that, uh, event I was telling you about, there were three people there that are huge doc, Dr. Joe fans. And I can tell you the, the, the things they have experienced. They just came back from a three-day retreat with him. Um, and it's interesting because he speaks, the work that he does explains why placebos work. Mm -hmm. Because we think we were given a, a drug. So our mind a neural pathways, which is connected to our spinal cord. I have a medical background, right? It works the same way the drug works. Absolutely fascinating. And this is this is ancient wisdom, pre what I say, pre AMA, AMA right? Pre the pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. And it, it's it's fascinating. Okay, Heather, how may people learn, find out more about you? Where would you like them to go? Yeah, my website's heathermonahan.com. I'm on all social media at Heather Monahan. My podcast is Creating Confidence with Heather Monahan. And my books are Confidence Creator and Overcome Your Villain. Great. So, Heather, thank you so much. This is absolutely fascinating. Thank you for your time and all your wisdom. And that concludes today's podcast episode of The Trust Doctor Restoring Trust and Enriching Significant Relationships. And if you like this, and I don't know how you could not have loved this interview, make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe to today's podcast. Thank you again, Heather. And until next time, be well.